what draws you to rare breeds? The challenge. The rare breeds, you have to just work that much harder. And it's more rewarding. On this episode of The Rabbit Show, we have Nathan Zem. Nathan is a prominent breeder within rare breeds. He always has ones that uh, just are so stunning to look at with their body type and, and color and fur and finish and everything is, is right about them. And we'll get into some of those rabbits later on uh, in this episode, but uh, it's a pleasure having you on, Nathan, and uh, um, thank, you, thank you for coming on. Oh, thank you for having me. Yeah, it's exciting to uh, it's exciting to be, to be focused on um, you know producing great rabbits within the rare breeds, and that's something that I know a lot of people have interest in, uh, and it's something that's extremely difficult to be able to do. That uh, you're not working with the same gene pool as what some of the other more popular breeds are. True, very true. So my first question is. What draws you to rare breeds? Um, the challenge. Just the challenge. And there's a lot of planning that people don't realize with rare breeds. You really need to have a three to five year plan with a rare breed to un or even a rare variety to bring it to where you want it. So let's, let's dive deeper in that. Why is that the case? And, and what are you meaning? Well, you said earlier with the genetics and the genotype out there, there's not a lot to work with. And the genotype is usually not as strong. Some cases there are, and it's just really tough to find where you're going to put into what to bring that up and crossing all of these, you know, rare breeds, you get such a variety of mess. You can argue in the litter of just complete inconsistency. I mean, that's the only consistency to start with is the incons inconsistency in the litter. They just, they don't have the right type. They don't have the right color. They don't have the right fur. A lot of them have the right color to start with. Um, it's mainly the type. And I guess when I look at the litters, I break it down into three phases of type I like to work with. And that's where kind of I put this plan is how I'm going to put all three of these phases together. I consider like the structure of the animal, you know, your width and your bone structure. Then I have another part that I look at with the profile, the top line and then the muscling. So, I mean, I, it's all three of them are never there to start out with. And so by having that three to five year plan, you know that you're just progressing each generation. Is that why, why it takes that long to be able to make good ones? Um, actually, no, I would say you progress your first litter with your first ones you start dealing with. And then your second and third crosses sometimes aren't as strong as your first crosses. And it's, after that, so when you start working these, it's really a big picture you have to look at. And that's to say three to five years, because I mean, some does you can get litters at six months, some does are eight to 10 months. So you got to allow for the size of the animal. Gotcha. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so following up with that, how, do you, how have you been able to get your animals up to the level of excellence of being able to be competitive, obviously nationally, mean the number of breed wins you've had, and get as many looks as you do for uh, best of group for the best in show at um, conventions? For one, a lot of people don't know when I start with them. I mean, you start the project and I don't, like I said, it's a three, five year project plan. And it's going out to figure out when you get all these first cross babies out of your original pair you work with. And it's how hard can you call them to start with? I mean, you just want to get as, breed that dough as many times as you can to really just start nitpicking. And like I said, it's, you start way before anybody else knows you have them. So when you're getting started in them, and if you want to dive into like one of the specific breeds, it's fine. Or if you want to keep it general, I'm, I'm good with that too. But like when you get started in that, what traits are you looking for and how do you build it? When I get started, I guess the first thing when I get started is what should be, is your homework on a breed first taking time to learn about the breed before you really start working with it and decide how you're going to 
breed with it is the first thing to do. And I like one thing I've learned too when doing your homework and learning about the breeds and what traits there are. It seems like different aspects of the country has different ideas on how to breed rare breeds. I mean, as a judge, you've probably learned that too through the years, haven't you? And you need to go talk to all those people to really understand what they're looking for, what they want in the breed, these experienced breeders. Okay. And then once you've gotten that foundation of knowing like what you're looking for, then you're going out and you're finding that stock that you want to have to be competitive. Yes. Uh, yeah. The stock can come from multiple areas um, and different ideas. I mean, with rare breeds or any breeder varieties that, I mean, there's no, there's no wrong way to be honest. You I've, had people tell me you can't do this to make it better. Well, it did. And people tell me, well, you, you got to do it this way. And it didn't. So. So then you are just getting like the gene pool within that breed itself. And you're not necessarily like going out to other breeds or do you bring in other breeds to make them better? It depends on the breed. Um, some breeds you have to really early. Um, some of the breeds they just don't have the appropriate like top line. A lot of rare breeds struggle with top lines. I've noticed on the muscling, especially the muscling in that lower hind quarter, just off the top line. I mean, you feel that just, they almost come to a V and yeah, you really need to, if you want to get it done quick, you need to look at a different animal or a different breed to bring in that's strong in that area. But then you're going to really bring in a whole mess of genetics and that's where it takes three, five, three to five years because you got to get all those genes working together. And when you're saying that you're, it's coming with a mess of genetics, are you meaning that it's a mess of like color genetics that's wrong? Or is it the fur genetics that are wrong? Like what, what is it? Everything, wrong fur. It can be the wrong type of fur, wrong, you know, you can get kinked fur. Seems like a rare breed will pull out the worst trait out of everything. And cause it's, they're very inbred and it's just, yeah, you're just working with a mess sometimes of babies and you'll just, the range of spectrum of the babies on the table you get is thing. That's why the number one rule with rare breeds is you got to call harder than you breed and you need to breed your does extremely hard. So like, are you saying like four times a year? How many times are you saying? <laughs> as many as I can get out of that doe in the first year. So once you end up doing that and you're, you're developing the gene pool and you go out and you crossbreed and, and, and uh, start with your line, then do you, you like close it off that it's, do you just stay more line bred then, or do you keep grabbing other genetics? It depends where your babies are and what pro, you know, what they're looking like. If you're getting one aspect a lot better, cause you only can, you know, let's take that loin. You can only get an animal to come in to help that loin you're still gonna have to go out and reach to figure out how to get the rest of the body or how to even improve the color. Cause sometimes you need to find a gene to bring that color to make it pop better. Some breeds can take up to four animals to bring in. Some breeds can take up to what? Four animals to bring in four other outcrosses to make the breed where you want it. And you're meaning like one specific, like, so say on American chins or okay. say, like you're, you're saying that you're having to bring in four different rabbits outside or like four different breeds. Uh, some, sometimes it's four different breeds. Sometimes it's four different rabbits. Um, with American chins, I had to utilize a couple different breeds plus a couple different lines of chins to really get the animal where I was content with it to put it on the table. I know, I know uh, like uh, the one of your most impressive American chins that I'd ever got my, my, my hands on was we were in uh, Wichita, Wichita, Kansas, can't talk. Um, and that, that note was just absolutely ripped with muscle. I mean, she felt exactly like what we, you know, assume out of a, a commercial breed of just wide, deep, full hindquarters, ripped loin, amazing uh, wide shoulders, and then a profile to go with it. I'll add her up. I had the picture of her here in the video, but, um, I know that she was stunning and then she had the color and everything to go with it. But I mean, what that, like a, <clears throat> something that's that elite and that you get to that level. I mean, that's an even longer than a five year project. That she took me about six years to get her there. Wow. And she was probably 
I think that was my second do I put out that quality. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's like I said, it's a five-year plan, at least you got to figure in with the American shins, I was able to get a litter out of them every seven months. A new generation litter, you mean? Sometimes, and sometimes it was just getting seven months and getting those babies and taking notes and just seeing how they developed and everything. And, you know, you get a hundred babies, you want to get that down to two. Why is that so important that you're taking notes on those animals as you're, as you're breeding them? And it, or let's start with that question. Well, take notes. Well, you want to see what they're developing, you know, the average size of litters, the growth rate of the litters, of course, with everything else. So you want to take notes of that for the does, because sometimes you get some does that just don't produce enough milk. I've noticed that in rare breeds that you take your Californians out there or New Zealand's, they're, they're great mothers. I mean, they put fat babies up there at eight weeks that, you know, we adjusted our meat pens because of these milkers and how good they grow. Then you get these rare breeds that just don't have them they just don't have the size, the muscle, the tone or nothing. So keep notes on that. And sometimes it's going out to bring a doe in from another breed that is a great record of producing milk and can raise these litters better to just give those babies a kickstart. And then how they develop, you know, different things of what you see. And yeah, I mean, like I said, it's a hundred rabbits. You keep two for rare breeds. You, uh, rare breeds, you got to call harder than New Zealand's and California's, unfortunately. <laughs> It totally makes sense though. And you're, you're picking out those top two so you can advance your program and keep it moving forward. Yeah, so, I mean, the smaller the herd, the better. I mean, someone once told me that 80% of your show rabbits come out of 20% of your herd. And I find that very true. That's interesting. Do you, so then, um, so then you're willing to foster those babies as well. That's what you're saying. Is that you would foster yes. yes, very much so. I recommend breeding as many does as you can at one time to keep your does going but then you can also take your best producing does for that breed and able to put them back in so you can get maybe one or two more litters a year out of them and then the fact that they're also getting the babies are getting milk by a better milking dough they just grow healthier and have better starts that makes sense and and, and like you said you can turn them around and, and breed them back again and sometimes you got to take those lines though two of those cross I call them hybrids, not crossbreeds, because I mean, you're breeding for a purpose. I like to take those milkers and put them in those rare breeds too, so they can have the milk production. Gotcha. So you actually are pulling that trade in, like an additional trade outside of what we're brewing for in the standard, so that you have the, the quality that you, that you need. Yeah. Um, my sister and I actually did a study together because we have a family project and my sister is part of that. And we tried that with one of our rare breeds. And we noticed the babies were 20% bigger out of these F2s, F3s versus the purebreds. Same amount of babies spread to the same sire. These does carried that producing doe. Interesting. So you're saying, uh, like, so you're saying on that though, that it's uh, even just like normal purebreds, like a, a New Zealand, like even if it was just like looking at a New Zealand do it, like you do see some hybrid bigger between that. I guess I don't really compare them to New Zealand's. I'm keeping them in the rare breeds for the hybrids that way and comparing them. I mean, I figure that New Zealand's and cows are producing well enough. I don't need to pay attention to that as much. Okay. Um, I think the cows and New Zealand breeders in the country did a good enough job of that already. <laughs> that's, that's fair. Um, so when you're going back to this, like the, you have, you produce a hundred babies and you keep two of them out of there. Um, mm -hmm. And you, and you keep them for that next generation. How long then are you keeping like a doe out of that? Or like, how long are you keeping the, the, the out of those two babies? How long do they stay in your bond in this whole project? It depends. I mean, if it's a great milking cow, you don't get rid of it. It's the slogan up here in Wisconsin. So, I mean, if they're producing and they're getting what you like, keep them. Um, and if you can get enough, the next generation where they're not, ready to be shown but you're getting enough quality does out of her i'd say three four then she's out so how many how many rabbits then do you need in total when you're when you're doing this like a, a rare breed to be competitive it just depends how comfortable you are in breeding how many does you want how many babies you want and how many how comfortable you are in getting those babies out of those i mean 
I like to keep five to 10 breeding does for a rare breed. I like to lean closer to that five to seven, but I like to have one or two backups coming in. But I don't like a lot because then it's more notes, it's more genetics, more stuff to figure out. So smaller, the better, I guess. Yeah, and then you're just, you're picking those best ones and keep, keep moving forward. It's cool. Yeah, like um, the American Chins, we only kept three does. Wow, I can't, I can't believe you could produce that rabbit with three does. She, I mean, she was at, she's one of my all-time favorite rabbits, like in my top five all time. It's impressive. Um, so similar question, if you have, like, does, does the answer change if you end up doing it with bucks? Like if you have a really hot buck, do you keep him longer or? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I like to have one and then I always try to keep, that one herd buck can last, you know, in those breeds three, four years at least. And it's kind of nice once you start getting those genetics where you want them, you want to just tighten them up a little bit because you put so much into them and you start throwing other stuff into them. Once you get them where you like them, you start losing your consistency. So, so from what you've said, you're finding your goal, then you're uh, finding the gene pool that you want to work with. Some of it's coming from inside the breed, different lines, then some of it's you're potentially going out and, and outcrossing. But then once you have it, then, you're, then you are more just line breeding to keep the consistency. Yeah, and you also need to look at too with the rare breeds. You know, you, you get your herd down that small, and you bring if you would bring an outsource in, you're going to have to go back out to that outsource in about three to four years just to reemphasize. Because when you take some of those rare breeds' colors or different markings, it, you get it back, and then you need to still improve it. Because every time you keep breeding up here, and when you, if you would bring in like a Californian, it starts slipping again. So you need to go out and breed bring that animal back in. And I recommend something related to the first animal you, you utilize for the type. So that then you have those, the gene pools more locked and you're, you're going to keep that consistency of type. Yep. And then you get to start the three-year process again. Wow. Wow. Um, you end up using some of those different gene pools together, like, a, like an American chin and the silver martin and all or no? You have to. You have to because, I mean, when you look at certain colors, you need, like you said, the complementary, like a goodies and tans go great together, tan patterns. I don't understand why, but genetically, they make the goodies better ring color and more crisp. Okay. Yeah, no, and that, that was kind of what I was thinking is that, like, say, like, say in Minirex, there's, it feels like a million different colors of Minirex, right? That, uh, um, yeah. If many if mini Rex were developed in the 1920s, they may have only had one variety or two varieties. Whereas you know now it's uh, it just seems like there's more popularity of having breeds have a lot of different colors. So I didn't I didn't know with your uh, the way you end up doing crosses and such if if you would feel that uh, those heritage or rare breeds um, would have a bigger overlap with them. Yeah, well, one thing when you bring up the Silver Martins to the American chins, I mean, you look at the standard chins, how they were developed, the Silver Martins did have a role in them, according to our history. Fair, yeah, yeah. I, I may have gone with a too extreme or too extreme of a, a weight range. Uh, it would have made more sense with like a standard chin, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's, so knowing the history of the animal, where I was saying, talking to the older people that breed, I shouldn't say older breeders, people that have the breeds longer, yeah, they'll fill you in on that kind of stuff of where the breed did originate from and what they've been told. Gotcha. Okay. Um, so this next one's more just specific of uh, like on when you're breeding American Sables, how often would you use a seal in your breeding program and then cross it with a white rabbit? Um. With the pointed whites are more common at the sables, I'd say, than the white ones. Okay. Um, not that much. I guess I keep more seal does and sable bucks we keep in our barn more than anything. Um, I guess for one, I never really notice I get many good pointed whites in them consistently. I know some people say they get better ones, but I guess our lines just don't demonstrate it. It seems like our best bodied ones are always seal does. It does darken the color a little bit, but that's, yeah. So I guess I'll keep three seal does for the barn, two probably sables and two 
sample box. Gotcha. So then that gives you like half the litter ends up being the the right like American sable color. Mm -hmm. And I think that's that's one of the most intriguing things I think with the uh, you know some of those the different color genetics is that uh, it, it ends up being uh, you know an American sable doesn't when you breed it to American sable it still ends up being an American sable but some of them are too dark because they're seals and some of them are the proper color it's different than other breeds where you just you breed a black to a black you get more black and you can they're, you know they're, they're showable it, it's uh, ma makes it that much more of a challenge. Yeah, I mean, yeah, because like you said, half the litter, no matter if you breed sable to sable, sable to seal, or point, pointed white to sable. Yeah, I mean, but one thing I know is like when you breed pointed white to seal, you don't get the consistency of color the rest of your herd does. Gotcha. It's kind of like breeding a Charlie to a solid. You don't get the consistent broken patterns you do when you breed a broken to solid. Makes sense. I understand what you're saying. Um, so then what's the best go-to breeds if you're breeding like a rare breed like if you're breeding american sable and you're breeding american shins like what's the best go-to breed to, to expand the gene pool get the traits you want to to improve type um this might offend some people um i know like the best consistent one out there they say is the white new zealand and I would agree they are pretty much the best body type to animals out there consistently and able to get your hands on, but you deal with a lot of stuff because you don't know what the white's covering up. And when you take the black New Zealands, they're just, they're just not as deep as the whites. And what I mean by deep, I mean the quality of availability is not as deep out there to get. I prefer the Californians because they're a little bit smaller than a New Zealand. And a lot of Californians have been bred up using some of the New Zealands from way back when. So they seem like a nice multi-purpose animal. But that's for commercial breeds. You know, when you also you take rare breeds, you got Americans and Beverins. Well, what do you breed those to? I guess I really don't have much experience with them. And then you also have your compact breeds that are a little more rare, like your silvers or your standard chins and stuff like that. So I mean, then you need to look for, I guess I'd recommend a self in those, something like a solid black Havana maybe or something, something that you know could be clean and pure so you don't have to bring in a lot of other color genetics in it. And that's why I you're trying, I'm the Californian. Because you're trying to you're trying to simplify that aspect of it because you don't want to mess up what you're trying to work on with the, the what makes the rare breed unique. Yeah, and, and when you do that too, I mean, you're going to mess up the colors that's part of the three to five year plan you got to have with this, just to really know that it's going to take me this long to clean the color and it's going to take me this long to improve the body. But I always say, start the body. And then, you know, and I said, you know, bring another one in in a few years to keep on getting it worse because you're trying to make it, you know, pure again with like a certain furs or origins like the champagnes or the bruins to get that factor back into it. Yeah. And then when you crawl back in to cross something in, you're starting again from scratch with your color. So you almost need to have two lines going. Oh, so, you need to, so you need to have a F3, F4, if you want to do it that way. And then an F1, F2 right behind it. So you can keep on slowly improving that way. That's incredible. It's incredible that you're able to do that and then have as, as few as, as you are within your gravity and still and make that kind of progress. Um, I mean, it just goes to show that, you know, as you're breeding, you really have to have a purpose for each one of those and, and then find those best ones. Yeah, that's what I said, take notes. <laughs> um, so do you feel there are rare breeds themselves that are interchangeable and that you can breed together? Um, I guess in honesty, yes, there would be, because I mean, like I said, you got to have the plan. So you have that many generations to you know fix what you messed up or i mean as many rare breeds as we raise as a family there's many times where i just will go out there and not like it where it's at f3 f4 and not progressing where i want and i'll just wipe out that whole line so i mean you got to be able to do that too just because you weren't in the the progress that you were thinking and, and you didn't feel like you had the traits to be able to keep making advancements yeah, I was trying to improve the density and brought in two different rex lines and had two different rex lines going on the side and wiped two of those out out of the four. So you have amazing rare breeds. Um, 
how do you create them? A lot of studying and a lot of hard work. I mean, people don't realize, like I said, the rare breeds, you have to just work that much harder. And it's more rewarding because, I mean, here I am being interviewed by a judge that judges a lot of nationals asking questions because they're recognized finally. And that feels great knowing that there's other people out there, too. Yeah, I mean, your, your animals just stand out. I mean, they, they're just they're magnificent as you know, representatives within the, that commercial body type uh, that they they're really outstanding. And then, oh, by the way, they also are in that rare breed. They have that absolutely beautiful color and coat, and they genuinely look like those breeds. Um, it, it, I know it's it's stunning. I, I'm thankful that I've got my hands on those animals as, as you produce them. Oh, um, you kind of already answered this one, but I still want to ask it. <clears throat> uh, how do you advance your breeding program when it's hard to find the traits you want? Think outside the box. What, be and what willing do you mean? To try some, be willing to try something different. By, by going and doing crossbreeding or and just finding different avenues? Yeah, that way or trying to find a different line or go back, look at your notes and see what traits are popping up and what traits you don't want. And sometimes it's even keeping an animal that... You know, it's not what you want, but it has that one trait you want that you've seen thrown off and on to bring back in. Okay. But yeah, like um, you said, the crosses do help a lot too, but you have to know what you're crossbreeding too. You can't just go out and buy an animal. You have to go out and buy an animal that fits what you need. And that's probably the hardest thing people don't realize. That it has the traits that you're looking for, that, it, that, that you need to advance for them. Yeah. Okay, so from an experienced breeder's perspective, if you were trying to improve type in your rare breed, in your herd, how would you do it? Um, are you asking like buck or doe or are you asking breeder? What are you asking? Like, yeah, how would you, if you, if you feel like you're, if you've kind of plateaued and that you, like you've had this line of, of rare breeds for a long time and you're an experienced breeder and, or you're, you're talking to an experienced breeder who, who um, has plateaued with their herd, how would you recommend improving type within their herd? Uh, that's why I said every three to five years, you start from, you start from scratch. So you don't plateau. Um, cause every step you work with, when you get it that far, you a plateau or start like you are losing it. So you have to go out and I almost recommend at that point, getting a doe, going out and get your hands on the best doe you can to fit what trait you want, no matter what it is. What, why is that? Um, I find out with doe is, is if you bring a doe in, cause we all know there's different lines that don't cross with different lines in many breeds. And you bring that that one in and you just don't like what you get. You're out just that doe and how many babies. You're not bringing a buck in to breed to everything. It completely makes sense. And then you're, so then once you get that doe to have a litter and you like something out of it, are you then you keeping a buck to breed over everything? Or, or it's just that you're just continuing to move forward at that point? It depends on if it's a bringing in another breed or another within the breed within um, the breed yeah. within the breed you'd hope to get a buck out of it then so you can have something related to your other stuff that'll help produce and keep those traits tighter when you bring something out of the breed you're stepping back to having completely unshowable rabbits usually so then you want to keep a handful of does out of her and then your next generation you hope to get one or two showable and slowly build it back up that way seems very logical it makes sense um, so then similar question, like as an experienced breeder and you want to improve the fur quality, like does your answer change all or you're still, that's just a component of what you're, you're doing. Um, no, you're right. The fur quality is part of it. And that's sometimes that th every three to five years too, is may not be the body. It might be, okay, my fur is lacking here. How do I get my fur there? And what I need to look for to get that for it could be 
some of the rare breeds like a little bit more density in their standard. So you might be to the point where, okay, I don't have quite enough density that is needed to get to the best in show table to win the group. Where am I looking at for that density aspect? That could be that um, piece. So yeah, I understand what you're saying. So you're saying that at that point you're you're figuring out where you can find that gene pool to get that specific trait you need to keep advancing your program. Yep. And then like I said, start again. I mean, it's with rare breeds, it's every three to five years, start again, start again, start again. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, and you, I understand what you're saying. You're saying that you're you're advancing, you're going to the next level, you're you're taking the breeding you're, program. You're hoping to. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, okay, so then same or so switching to like a new breeder, like as somebody that's very excited about wanting to get into rare breeds, mm -hmm. what would be the way that you would recommend them getting into the to the rare breed? Oh boy. <clears throat> you want to keep that excitement and you want to work with them. And the hard part with that is is there's with rare breeds, there's very diluted genetics out there and the quality of animals available. And you'd almost want to get them started in something that they can go look at. Like you brought the American chins a bunch of times. So if you they get started in a pair of American chins, you'd want to have them go find something comparable to them, like a California, New Zealand, so they can see what the type is supposed to look like to keep their enthusiasm you know, this is what you need to work towards. Otherwise, they're just going to get lost seeing the same animals. And a lot of those new breeders that are showing, I mean, there's, there's no competition. There's no, you don't get the same remarks as you would in a class of one versus a class of five. And that's one thing, too, I'd recommend with new breeders, too, with rare breeds is if you have a commercial body, you can't watch your breeds get judged. You got to go watch the very competitive commercial breeds to learn what judges are talking about. And I think that makes complete sense because you, what you're saying is that you're, or by, by knowing that this commercial body type, this is what they're supposed to look like. These are what the great ones look like that are out there being competitive. And if my goal as a breeder is to beat or create the best animal that's, you know, best closest to the standard, mm -hmm. it has to be highest at this point categories for the breed to then be competitive and have a great commercial type to be the California or be the New Zealand. Um, and yeah. I, and I, I agree with you. I think that that's one of the things that makes it really difficult is that uh, when you are only competing against yourself, you're not seeing that, you know, Hey, I, I need this. I, I need the hind quarter to be wider. I need the loin to be wider. And I mean, how many judges, and this isn't ripping judges, how many judges take the effort to go over two rabbits versus 20 rabbits and get the, different com the same comments? You know, you're going to be, 20 rabbits, you're going to be a little harsher with your comments versus two rabbits, especially if it's a first-time breeder. I mean, they get excited and you're happy to see the energy and you feed off it as an exhibitor, as a judge, as everything, because it's just new excitement to the hobbies. But, well, we always need that. Yeah, and it totally makes sense. And and that that uh uh yeah, it to totally makes sense. Um when you're when you are crossbreeding, I'm changing the theme a little bit back back again, but um when you are crossbreeding to different breeds and uh the first structure ends up changing or potentially it has a potential change. How do you keep that proper fur structure within those rare breeds that's much different than a California? What, like that it's a black coat that uh, versus the fly back? I recommend keeping the does and keeping bucks at the best, get the bucks at the best fur you can and slowly work that up. And that's, you know, you brought up, you know, where they plateau at. Well, that's where you start to plateau at. You know, you just keep on breeding the same animals, the same animals. Yeah, that's why that's why I said those always those 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 those. Gotcha. Uh, so when you're when you have rare breeds that have very unique color, American Shan, American Sable, um, 
how do you get them to have prime fur and prime color and be in their best light on a show that's that you're really hoping to go to in the future? Um, plan breeding. Lots of plan breeding. Knowing one thing too, you know, when you start doing those outcrosses or outcrosses within the breeds is knowing what time of the year to also do them at. So you're not, if you have a good buck and doe you want to utilize and you want to do something different with them, like to even just bring in a better fur quality, but you know, it's not going to be the same body, just knowing those babies need to be born and then keeping notes. Cause I mean, you're taking so many more genetics that you know, every rabbit matures differently. Every line does. So that's hard too, is when you start doing all that stuff, when do your rabbits are prime? Yeah, it makes sense. Cause you got, you got tons of potentially different gene or genes you're working with and and it's not as predictable so but by keeping great notes and and uh, knowing how your specific line develops it makes sense that timing your breeding is super important yeah because when you take all these genetics and start trying to improve something you got stuff that primes at four months four and a half months and stuff that primes at eight months when are your rabbits going to prime yeah um what are the most important traits that you breed for uh, within rare breeds? I really try concentrating on the top line and the lower loin because I feel those are the two weakest areas of the rare breeds. And I feel when you get those, a lot of judges are very impressed by them and it's easier to sneak a rabbit up a placing by doing that. Fair enough. And yeah, and that makes them that much more impressive when they're uh, up there competing for best in the show. Yeah. It makes them get a second look if you have something that the rest of the breed doesn't have. Cool. I do have one more question that, that reminded me of it. Um, if you were a new breeder and you were excited about getting into a specific rare breed uh, or into rare breeds, is it better to focus on one specific rare breed or to, if you want to be successful and raise ones that are top notch quality to the standard, or is it good to just get into a bunch of rare breeds? That's a really, really interesting question. Cause there's two ways to look at it that we've discussed as a family. Um, one thing with my family, people should know is it's my wife, you know, we have one daughter in it. We have, our, my sister and my parents. So we have a debate with how many adults. And the debate is, is would we do better with only emphasis on one breed versus multiples? And I always go back and look at with one, you can concentrate on one. You have how many less lines to worry about, how much or less of everything. But when you have multiple breeds, you get more exposure to different people. And there's a lot more ideas floating around when you start talking to different breeders of different breeds that you can pull in to try in other breeds. And to me, that has been more valuable just listening to a lot of other breeders talk. I mean, people that have had an influence on where I am as a breeder and my breeding program is there's a lot of breeders because of all the breeds we have raised in the past. That's very interesting. And it totally makes sense, though, because you're getting exposure to a lot of different ideologies that impact how you have been able to develop your mind and, and develop your breeding strategies. Yeah. And one breed, what they say is wrong is right in the other. And, and that's where you get all those different opinions. And sometimes it's fun just to go try out and find out why they're wrong. And sometimes you find out that with the rare breeds, they're wrong for the first F1. And F1s are not just crossbreeding. That's taking two different lines and putting them together, two that you, people need to recognize when you hear that term. It can be right with your F2s or F3s if you see the process through. Yeah, so, and I think that's the main thing that you've been saying is that with it being a very long-term type of project, 
mm-hmm. you're, you're not just working on, hey, I'm going to breed this to be able to get this, and that's going to be the winner. It's the, it's yeah. the, it's the it journey. <laughs> it's the journey that makes you successful. It, it is. And with the rare breeds, it is a journey. You know, that's why I keep on saying every three to five years, you know, it's just you got to have the next plan before you get past those F2s. Makes sense. Um, what do you feel are your biggest accomplishments as a rare breed breeder? I don't know. Like I said, we've had enough of them and we've won six classes, best in the shows, four classes, multiple convention wins. I know I've been close to group wins a few times. We've won multiple spring nationals. I, I guess I really don't know. I mean, one point in our Blanc de Hoto herd when we had them, our, we had seven of them breeding and five of them were pure and the worst one was the best opposite sex at a spring national. That was the worst one out of the five you had that you were breeding with? Mm-hmm. The other four were best of breed winners. Wow. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, like I said, I don't know. And a lot of our rare breeds, you know, are just, like I said, I mean, it's when I say it's the process, I don't think people realize how much, how long, how much thought I put into that. I don't know. You probably didn't knowing that you're always putting the next generation in. It's definitely a different, or it, it's the same philosophy that people should have in order to make area rabbits in total. But I think that it's different in the sense that you may not get something that's a product that you're able to, to to take to the shows and do well with that you have to be invested for that long-term multi multiple years. And that's why most people say don't crossbreed and they don't like crossbreeding because of that. Yeah. But that's what, where you get all those additional traits that you might need to advance your breeding program. I think your, your breeds, your rabbits are impressive. Um, and I know that you're a great breeder uh and it just happens to be that you're in the rare rare breed but i mean that i know that yours would be competitive whether they were in a rare breed or in a popular breed i i mean i definitely respect your opinion as a as a breeder well thank you well those are all the questions i have unless you want to dive into a specific topic uh more or if you had something you want to cover um I, like I said, I rare breeds is just, you need to call harder and keep fewer. I, that's one thing I try emphasizing to a lot of people. And it's hard because when you have that many more people calling that much harder, there's less available at the, like the national or the convention. And it's harder to get people involved with that way. And I just hope you can figure out the emphasize that three to five year plan. I mean, cause that's the biggest thing I've learned this is what you do next. There's a huge interest in rare breeds and it's something that I know that they, people want to be able to have them be a high quality. And I think that they, they're looking for a pathway forward for themselves. I I definitely appreciate your time and and having the discussion. And it's uh, interesting learning from great breeders like yourself. And, and uh, I know that a lot of people appreciate your input and insight and I appreciate you doing this. Oh, no, it's an honor for you to say that about me. Thank you. And it, 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 it is a some family thing that does it all. And it's nice having all those opinions of my dad being a dairy farmer and bringing those aspects. And my sister has, you know, degrees with biology and animals and wildlife. So that helps too. I mean, you take all those aspects together. <laughs>